Okay, today I want to speak to you about uh, optical quantum information and with the idea of thinking about optics as a platform for doing quantum information. So it's a huge area actually because there's, there's a very large parameter space that we need to consider in order to think about what optics is used for, the different ways that it's used and the different uh, sort of architectures or foundations on which we build it as a matter of technology. And so I've divided uh, the topic really into these five topic areas, which we're going to take a bit of an overview, a bit of a flyover of each of them. So what are the tasks that one might do, uh, the encodings that might be used uh, in optics, uh, the components that we use to realise those encodings, so this is uh, very much starting to think platform-based, uh, how they can be used to implement different computation models and what you might call, I don't know, the substrates or the, or the, or the material systems uh, that are going to be used uh, in order to, to build devices. So maybe I should start by saying why is it that we're interested in optics for quantum information science? And really it's because optics provides uh, low noise systems. Okay, so the light from the uh, Crab Nebula, six and a half thousand light years away, is still very polarised when it reaches us here at Earth. Okay, so uh, if we're able to, uh, you know, have uh, light uh, and prepare it in a really clean state, uh, then uh, it doesn't interact particularly strongly uh, in non-resonant systems, and so we can keep things uh, very clean. Uh, also, we're able to detect uh, light at quantum noise limit, limited levels, okay? Detection is exceptionally good, and so we have a clean and, and uh, flexible system. We also have highly developed optical techniques. We've been doing interferometry as a science community for over 150 years, similarly polarisation control, and so these kinds of classical optics techniques can be uh, translated to the quantum uh, realm as well. Uh, also, we can muster lots of photons. Okay, if photons or other optical quantum states are going to be our quantum systems, uh, we actually have access to enormous numbers of them. Okay, so we, can, uh, we already have experiments where millions of photon pairs are generated a second, where they're generated in, in, in many tens um, uh, at a time, including in, in, in my lab. Um, and so the, the question then becomes not can we generate them, but how do we control them? Okay, but in terms of the number of raw systems, not, not a problem. Uh, and another really attractive reason for considering optics is, of course, in the classical regime, it's already a platform uh, for networking. Uh, we already know that our world is connected up by optical fibres, and uh, we work at, in this, uh, the telecom regime through optical fibres because losses are low, we can send signals long distances, and uh, we can communicate very, very quickly. So these are some of the reasons why we might consider optics as a quantum information platform. And of course, um, I've already alluded to the fact that um, perhaps unlike uh, some of the other platforms that we might talk about, uh, there's more than just uh, one or two uh, tasks for using optics. So computing, quantum computing is one, but uh, quantum networks is another one. Okay, and we heard in Howard Wiseman's tutorial that other things like making precision measurements or doing other quantum uh, enhanced processes uh, are in the mix as well, but I won't talk about those things today. So uh, computation, uh, we're thinking about using optics for intermediate and for uh, universal processing tasks. Uh, the first optical CNOT gate uh, demonstrated here was demonstrated in our centre. Um, and uh, I'll say a little bit more about computation uh, later on. But I do want to point you to a resource that you might be interested in if you're thinking about photonic or quantum uh, computing with photons. Uh, it's this review paper. Pardon me, co authored by Sergey and myself. Uh, what's really nice about this paper is that it's relatively short. Okay, it's got a heck of a lot of references and it references reviews that, that look at all the different sub areas, uh, but uh, it's a pretty entry level document. So if you have a new PhD student or you're just not particularly aware with it, uh, why don't you start here and then you can dive into as much of this uh, sort of more detailed literature as you'd like. Um, the other thing that I'm going to talk about in the, uh, well, I'm not going to talk about very much in this talk, but I want to talk about it now, is the idea of <clears throat> using optics for networks. The idea of extending networking to the quantum regime uh, for security reasons, for linking processes together. And uh, what I want to tell you is that the main challenge is optical loss. And in other parts of this conference, uh, you'll hear about uh, centre-developed and centre-implemented techniques uh, for, for dealing with loss in, in optical encodings. Okay, and so if we put the networking and the computation together, we can imagine some sort of distributed quantum processing. 
All right, so if we're going to think about uh, doing these quantum information tasks with optics, we need to think about how we're going to encode our quantum information into optical systems. And today I'll talk about uh, discrete encodings, or using single photons, uh, and continuous uh, encodings, which is really more than just squeezing, but uh, that, that's a little bit of a, an entry point into the field. And so to talk about this, we want to really start with the fact that in optics, the most natural thing to talk about isn't so much the photon as the fundamental particle. It's really the idea of an optical mode. This is something like a beam of light, OK? And it's not just defined uh, by, by its spatial beam, like this laser pointer, but also by things like its frequency, by its timing envelope, uh, by things like its transverse spatial mode. What shape is the cross-section of that beam? Is it Gaussian or have some more uh, complicated Hermite Gaussian mode, for example? and something like its polarization, okay? So if we have a particularly well-defined uh, property in each of these and perhaps some other degrees of freedom, then we can talk about an optical mode. And this is something that in quantum mechanics we model as a harmonic oscillator when we quantize light. Okay, so th the most obvious thing is to take this optical mode that we've defined and to plop a photon into it, a single photon. OK, but this by itself isn't a qubit because we need a two-level system. And so as Tim told us, uh, a very natural way to do this is to superpose a photon across two different optical modes. OK, perhaps they're two different spatial modes, as I've drawn here, or more commonly, uh, two different polarization modes. But it will depend a little bit on what materials platform we're going to end up using uh, in conjunction with our optics. OK, one of the, if the photons in the top mode, we can call this a logical zero state. We label as one photon in mode A and zero in mode B, uh, vice versa for the, for the other logical state. And of course, we can make superpositions uh, between one photon in one mode and uh, one photon in the other mode. And, uh, and then we're off and going with photon qubits. But of course, uh, a single photon isn't the only thing we can put into an optical mode. And in general, a single optical mode might have a pure state uh, that looks something like this, a coherent superposition of the vacuum, one, two, three, and, and higher order uh, photon terms as well. In fact, uh, the most common uh, optical quantum state, you might say, is the coherent state. Uh, it's, a, it's a quantum version of, of a nice uh, monochromatic wave. Uh, and we think of this uh, in... Um, in a photon number basis as being expanded something like this, OK? And uh, so you have these different photon number distributions for different average photon numbers given by mod uh, alpha squared. OK, but um, if we want to think about how we, how we actually deal with this, how we think about it, how we measure it, then we can start with our classical notion of the quadratures of light. So uh, as I say, a monochromatic wave, we can think of it as having a sine omega t and a cos omega t component. We can write this down in a phasor diagram of our two quadratures, one proportional to sine or cos, uh, and uh, the phase given by the angle of this phasor. And in quantum light, we come along and we just add Heisenberg's uncertainty principle to this. Okay? There's some uncertainty, this ball on a stick diagram here, which is associated with the fact that these two quadratures, x plus and x minus, these quantum quadratures, are really like the position and momentum of the harmonic oscillator. They don't commute, and therefore there's a, uh, an uncertainty relationship between them. And the key thing about that is because in the uncertainty relation, uh, we can trade off the uncertainty in P and X. Similarly here, we can trade off these uncertainties, and we can squeeze one of them or reduce the uncertainty uh, at the expense of the other one. And it turns out that this is a powerful uh, resource for optical uh, quantum information science. Uh, okay, uh, I also want to point out that in, in many experiments, it's the vacuum itself, the, the zero photon state, uh, which is squeezed, and so uh, that's, that's commonly what you'll hear about. Okay, so uh, if we have uh, these continuous variable states, continuous because those quadrature measurements can give us any continuous value, uh, then we need to turn that into some sort of, uh, you know, qubit. So we might do something like using superpositions of coherent states. We might do something like using uh, gottesman uh, kataev preskill states. And there are other encodings as well, and I think you'll probably hear something about those later in this conference. Uh, I, I don't want to go into the technical details of all of these, but simply to say that if we think about this, uh, this quadrature phase space, there are different ways of defining uh, orthogonal states within the space uh, in which you, can, which you can use as basis states for computing, and of course you can make superpositions of them. 
All right, so there are many, many uh, groups around the world working in all of this different space, working with the discrete variable encoding, the continuous variable encoding, and working on some of the different kinds of problems that we're about to speak of at the moment. Uh, here's a list in no particular order, and it's not even a complete list because uh, this just captures a number of the major players, some of whom, by the way, are our partners within the center and uh, who, who you'll hear about in other parts of this and other talks. Uh, in this space, there's also a couple of major companies pursuing these approaches, okay? And there are two in particular uh, that are notable. In the photon encoding space, there's uh, Cy Quantum, uh, based in California, CEO'd by Jeremy O'Brien, a former CQC2T member, and um, uh, also uh, Xanadu, based in Canada, looking at continuous variables approaches. Uh, Christian Weebrook, who's also out of a, a centre background as well. So uh, these are the two big players in, in uh, this space. I now want to talk a little bit about components, OK? So we have this idea that we can encode quantum information into light. And uh, the question is, uh, how do we do that? What is the hardware that we need in order to make this happen? And it really comes down to implementing, <coughs> pardon me, sources of quantum light, detection of quantum light, and in the middle, some operations that one performs on it. OK, so here's, here's a cartoon picture of optical quantum information science. It's a cartoon because it's really not representing any uh, circuit in particular, and it's not even particularly general, but it gives us a little bit of a flavor of what we might do uh, with um, optical quantum states. Well, first of all, we have these S's. We need sources of states. We need to generate um, our, our light, and we need to encode information into it. OK, then we need to do some, some processing on it, which is some single qubit operations, some interactions between different qubits, uh, maybe some memory to store the light, although that's maybe not necessarily needed, as we'll talk about in a moment. And then often optical uh, computing progresses by detecting uh, some of these uh, photons, reading them out, and then using that information to feed forward onto the states of the remaining photons. And then one can introduce some, some new photons or some new quantum states and continue this until finally at the end one, one reads out. OK, so you can see that then we need to talk about sources, processing, and detection uh, as part of this model. So in the continuous variable picture, um, again, there are different ways of doing things, but often it comes down to uh, the sources of quantum light being squeezers, which are optical parametric amplifiers uh, working in a particular regime. Okay, so this might be something like a, uh, a nonlinear crystal, which is pumped by a laser uh, in some sort of cavity structure. And uh, in this uh, regime, uh, they produce squeezed vacuum is typically what happens. And we can see up about 15 dB of noise suppression in, in one uh, quadrature. Okay, And so then with this, uh, depending on how you set up the optics and, and the properties of this squeezer, you can then uh, use different modes of light. You could think about temporal modes, frequency modes, spatial modes, uh, see squeezing in all of these different polarization modes, squeezing in all of these different degrees of freedom. Pick whichever one is most suitable for your applications. Uh, the, the low noise detection that I mentioned earlier is typically done by... Um, balanced homodyne detection. And so the idea is to take uh, the quantum state of interest and to mix it on a beam splitter or to interfere it on a beam splitter with a local oscillator, which is typically a, a coherent state over which you have uh, precise control. Uh, and then these are detected on high uh, efficiency photodiodes. Okay, the different signal here gives us some, some uh, common mode noise rejection, and we're able to make these quadrature measurements uh, that I spoke about earlier. And measuring in different projections in that quadrature space is, is achieved by tuning the phase of the local oscillator. Okay, and so high efficiency, low noise uh, measurements. So these are very robust techniques that work incredibly well. I haven't mentioned entanglement um, here, but I want to tell you that there's a beautiful thing about continuous variables and squeezing, which is that if you take two uh, squeezed states and you put them onto a beam splitter, you can make an entangled state, okay? And it's a very sort of simple deterministic uh, process. It's a really, really beautiful technique. 
Okay, so if we're thinking about a photonic encoding, then obviously making photons is the name of the game. And the obvious way to think about that is to take a, a system that has a single excitation in it to let that excitation uh, collapse and to, for the energy to come out in the form of a photon. Okay, So perhaps we have, uh, like we learn in, in first year university, uh, some sort of atom that's in an excited state and it emits a photon, something like that. Okay, uh, in order to be able to uh, control and to capture that photon, it turns out that some sort of artificial atom, like an NV center or like a quantum dot, uh, as uh, the example from the Senelar group here, uh, it turns out to be a good way to do it. Why is that? Well, in here we have a quantum dot, which is in a uh, micropillar structure here, which means that uh, the photon can be collected and emitted in a preferred direction. Okay, so it makes it uh, that unlike a, an isolated single atom which radiates in all directions, uh, here we can have some uh, directional emission. And so uh, the papers uh, from this and from other teams uh, are really starting to show some, some amazing results in this case. Um, these kinds of technologies uh, give us a good step towards uh, what we want, which is sort of deterministic, so on-demand photons, pure photons, usually temporarily, temporarily short, so that we can um, uh, you know, access them uh, on, a, on a fast cycle, uh, and uh, photons that are indistinguishable, so that if I take two photons from the same device or from two separate devices, they can be interfered with very high uh, fidelity. And quantum dots are one of the contenders for this kind of, uh, uh, for, for meeting these kinds of goals. Another contender, um, which seems like at first an unnatural one, but is actually an exceptionally good uh, contender, is the idea of spontaneous parametric down conversion. So in this process, there's a nonlinear crystal, which is this sort of uh, solid uh, vertical box that's pumped by a bright laser. And sometimes, uh, randomly, pairs of photons are emitted. So one of the pump photons is destroyed, and conserving energy and momentum, a photon pair is generated. OK. Uh, these are generated randomly, and so that doesn't seem so useful, but because they're generated in pairs, uh, if we measure one of those photons, uh, then with extremely high efficiency, in principle unit efficiency, uh, but in practice a number given by the so-called heralding efficiency, depending on various experimental uh, constraints, with very high efficiency, uh, we can have one uh, photon in the other arm, and with a suitable kind of detection, we can guarantee that we have one and only one photon here. Okay, and so while this source is not inherently deterministic, it does produce, uh, if they're properly engineered, very pure, very indistinguishable, and in every other way, very nice uh, photons. So, um, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about quantum dots and down conversion, but keep in mind that there are al alternative uh, technologies as well, but perhaps they're the two front runners at the moment. Okay, so uh, in the center, uh, we're very good at doing high performance spontaneous parametric down conversion. Uh, here's an example of, of a setup uh, that does that. Uh, basically, uh, here's the pump laser and the down conversion crystal. And then here are the two photons, one of which is detected. Well, here the other one's detected as well, but in principle, it can go off uh, to, to experiments and you can do, do what you want. Uh, you can have very high visibility, typically 99% or better, um, and uh, also very high heralding efficiency. Uh, so far in unentangled sources, and also these sources can generate entangled pairs, although not in a heralded way, and again, uh, with very high efficiency. Okay, so numbers sort of including the ultimate detection efficiency, uh, so factoring nothing out at all, sort of uh, getting to the 85 plus percent uh, kind of range. All right. So um, down conversion uh, is a promising uh, technique for giving us um, a nice pure uh, photons, but even so, uh, we have to herald those photons, and uh, those heralding events happen at random times. How can we take that sort of technology and turn it into a source that's, that's periodic or that's perhaps triggered so that when you press a button, so to speak, a photon comes out? And the idea here is to use what's often known as multiplexing, okay? And, and it's quite a simple idea. The idea is that one takes many such sources, four are, are shown in this particular diagram, and each of these sources will fire randomly in time, okay? But uh, one of the photons from each of them goes, goes to a detector, and we see which one fires. And then uh, whichever one fires, uh, we switch the corresponding mode, so perhaps it's the top one, 
here's the remaining photon, we switch that into the output. Okay? And with sufficiently many uh, sources, uh, then one can have a very high probability of being able to complete this protocol um, uh, and, and have uh, near deterministic single photon sources. Uh, I should just say that uh, the reverse is also possible to use a similar kind of uh, technology uh, to, to go uh, from one particular pulse train here into different spatial modes. And so here's an example of centre work uh, that's doing exactly that. So this is uh, from uh, the group of Miyako Lubino uh, collaborating with uh, his, his colleagues at University of Queen, or our colleagues at University of Queensland. And um, the idea here is to have a lithium niobate uh, waveguide device with fast switches here that switch basically uh, the light between these different output modes, okay? So the quantum dot here in this case emits this uh, pulse train of photons, and the idea is, is that's all very nice if we want them in temporal modes, but perhaps we want to switch them out into uh, different spatial modes. And so that's possible uh, by, by basically using this lithium niobate device, which I'll say more about a little later in the talk, uh, in order to do that. And you can see that you can get switching between channel 1 and 2, channel 1 and 3, and so on. Okay. And the key thing is, is that this is all done in a, in a compact integrated platform and can be done at very high speeds. Okay, so switching between time and uh, space are possible for a bunch of different uh, applications. I should just also point out that uh, one of the apparent inconveniences of the first multiplexing scheme I showed you is that one has to have many sources in parallel, but you can temporally multiplex uh, instead. So instead of uh, just having, uh, so you, instead you just have one source here, uh, the photons here are sort of spat out at various random times. Wherever one of these pulse pairs is full, then we're imagining a pair being generated. If we define a block of these pulses as being one clock cycle, then within the clock cycle, it's very likely that one of these, uh, one of these, one of these pulses will be filled, and we can uh, store uh, the pulses in a loop and then switch out the one where it was stored in a periodic fashion as shown here. And this isn't um, only hypothetical. Uh, there's a group, uh, Paul Quiet's group at the University of Illinois, who have done exactly this. Uh, the experiment looks rather uh, complicated, but we can focus in on the key part here uh, in the middle. This, uh, this loop here, this triangular loop, is, is the, the storage loop for the photons. Here's the detector that heralds uh, the presence of it. A photon is switched into this loop, and then at the end of the, end of the clock cycle, uh, it can be uh, switched out with high uh, efficiency and high fidelity. Okay, so um, here's an example of a graph taken from a quantum dot paper from the Senelar group, which is comparing uh, different kinds of sources uh, across the horizontal axis, roughly speaking, is the quality of the source. Um, I won't go into detail about exactly what this M uh, parameter quantifies, but it's, it's, it's approximately how interferable the photons are, so one is ideal. Here's the brightness. Brightness 1 in this context means every time you ask for a photon, you, you can collect and use uh, exactly one photon. Obviously, one can go down from there. So down conversion gives you very, very clean photons. Uh, these are these uh, sort of grey uh, markers over here on the right-hand side of the graph. Uh, but you can see that without any uh, additional techniques, uh, the, the rates can be low because the probability of, of getting an emission uh, is low. It's a random uh, process. Okay, quantum dots uh, given here, different groups, including the red uh, ones by the Senelar group, uh, are, give you higher performance, but still uh, we're talking about 20, 30% uh, brightness. Okay, and some of them um, high, high, uh, high interference uh, probability and some of them not so much. If you take separate dots, uh, dots uh, photons interfered from two completely separate devices that have different materials properties, uh, then uh, even though they're in principle identical, uh, then these numbers tend to decrease. So the quiet result I just showed you is, is up here. This is what you can do by heralding uh, down conversion. Um, and uh, this was, the, I guess, the first time it's been done in a very serious way. Uh, so you can see um, pretty high efficiency and the visibility is not too bad. Uh, with some simple improvements, uh, one could immediately get to the green dot. And I would just say that uh, the kinds of down conversion source, the high uh, quality sources that we make, are, are very much integratable into this kind of uh, technology. And,
this of this plot would be truly interesting for LOQC? How small a corner would be truly interesting for LOQC? Um, how long's a piece of string? <laughs> it's it's a it's a tricky question. Um, it depends on what encodings you want to use. Maybe I'll say more about it at the end if that's if that's okay. Yep. Uh, okay. So uh, that's making photons. Uh, we need to measure them as well. Uh, and the idea here is that we're looking to you know, detect a very small amount of energy of order 10 to the minus 19 joules, okay, for the kinds of photons that we're interested in. And there's much to be said about detectors, but let's just go to the state of the art, which is superconducting detectors. And one of the leaders in this field um, is the group of Sewu Nam at NIST, who makes these uh, transition edge superconducting and these nanowire superconducting detectors uh, in tungsten silicide. There are other groups uh, making competing uh, platforms or, or doing, uh, making similar things. There are companies that produce these, although I believe that at the moment, Sewu makes the highest quality uh, ones. Uh, nevertheless, there's an effort here with our own uh, Sven Rog group uh, to make uh, very similar nanowire devices, not only uh, just the sort of simple basic device here that one uh, then uh, shines an optical fiber, that's what this uh, white circle here is, the, the, the output mode of an optical fiber. Uh, not only just the basic device which you position under an optical fiber, but also patterning it on top of uh, other different waveguide structures and uh, they're customizable in all sorts of different ways. All right, so you'll notice that I haven't really said anything about operations, despite promising to talk about sources, operations, and detectors. And in order to do that, I want to say a little bit about um, computation models, okay? Because uh, the way the operations are done in optics depends a little bit on whether you're thinking about a circuit model or a cluster model of uh, quantum computation. All right, so the circuit model we, we well know. Uh, you take uh, some, some circuit that you want to make and you decompose it typically into uh, single qubit and uh, two qubit operations. Uh, this is uh, the circuit uh, for realizing a Toffoli, a three qubit Toffoli gate, for example, okay, composed of single and uh, two qubit. Uh, operations. Okay, and you can see that uh, uh, obviously there's, there's quite a lot of operations to be done here, uh, including a lot of two qubit gates uh, in order to make any decent sized circuit. And we saw in Lloyd's talk about uh, universal quantum computation that there are going to be enormous numbers of gates that need to be realized. So in, in terms of realizing these gates, optics has some advantages and some disadvantages. Okay, one of the advantages is that it's very easy to move in and out of the computational subspace in a very clean way, and to do that uh, in a way that allows you to really uh, simplify uh, the way that you can perform some of these gates. Okay, so some work from uh, Tim Ralph and a number of other collaborators, group at Bristol and others, Andrew White's group, um, has led to you know, techniques for doing uh, exactly this kind of thing. But at the same time, as we'll see in a moment, one of the challenges of optics is that doing the two qubit gates is hard, although doing one qubit gates uh, is easy and they can be done with high fidelity. Okay, so to do a, a two qubit gate, for example, a, uh, a controlled knock gate, um, we need to make two photons uh, talk to each other, two photons interact. And uh, I said that photons are very low no system because they don't really like to interact with non-resonant systems and they certainly don't like to act with um, other photons. Okay, so single photon operations are easy and robust, not so easy for two photon uh, operations. The basic idea introduced by Jared Milburn is to use some sort of nonlinear phase shift in some nonlinear material, okay? So occur uh, chi 3 nonlinearity, and the idea is, is that if both the photons end up uh, in this, in this nonlinear device, so uh, here's, here's a control photon. As we said, it's either in the top mode or in this mode. Here's the target photon. It, it's either in one of these two modes or, of course, a superposition. Uh, if the photons both end up inside the phase shift, uh, then there's a pi phase shift, mutual phase shift between them. Uh, the interferometer reads that out and flips the phase of the, the, the target qubit at the output. That's how this kind of CNOT gate uh, would work. Okay, but these single photon level nonlinearities are extremely uh, hard to obtain. That's not to say that people are not working on this topic, uh, and indeed, um, uh, very strong uh, kernel on linearities are being achieved in resonance systems coupled with, with cavities. Here's a couple of examples. There's a lot of work going on uh, around the world on it. 
But these sort of single uh, system, single, single atom or single uh, resonant system kind of devices um, really have some outstanding challenges in order to become, uh, uh, in order to become uh, you know, robust long-term technology. Uh, one needs to see higher fidelity operation, true single photon operation, and then there are questions about integration loss and bandwidth and so on. Perhaps solvable, but, but it's not straightforward. Uh, an alternative is to use an ensemble-based approach, and this is something that Ben Buchler's group is looking at here in CQC2T. The idea is to have some sort of spin wave, which is what's depicted here, in, in, uh, stored in some uh, uh, atomic medium, some ensemble atomic medium, and then uh, using the slow light or the stop light, the stationary light based on that, to achieve a small uh, nonlinear phase shift which can then be um, sort of amplified up, if you will, uh, using theory techniques that have been proposed uh, previously. So nonlinear interactions are one way um, to try to achieve um, uh, photonic quantum computing. Uh, or indeed, that also can apply to continuous variables approaches as well. But another way is to think about using linear optics gates. Okay? And the idea here is, is sort of something roughly like this. If you interfere two photons uh, on, a, on a suitably chosen beam splitter, uh, then non-deterministically, but with some uh, probability, uh, there can be uh, a phase shift that appears, a pi phase shift exactly like you would have uh, in, a, um, in, in one of these uh, Kerr gates. OK, so that's what the minus sign depicts, but the one-third prefactor here depicts that this is a non-deterministic process. That by itself isn't a showstopper. Um, uh, Canil, Laflamme, and Milburn showed how to integrate these kinds of beam splitters into some of these devices here, which then get concatenated up into larger circuits, and you keep going and keep going, and ev eventually you have something that's very close to a, a deterministic gate. But the challenge is that a large number of resources, like photons and components, are required. Even though it scales linearly with the number of qubits, uh, it's, um, it's still a significant overhead, although theory has brought that down over the years. An alternative is to consider a cluster state model. Now, in the cluster state, uh, what we're thinking about is constructing a large entangled state offline, if you will, or before the computation. So something like this, here's a two-dimensional version. Uh, so this grid, each of the nodes is a qubit, and the lines between them in indicate an entangling operation. So uh, these qubits are uh, entangled to their neighbors. Uh, so one, one creates such a 2D or 3D cluster, and then uh, performs a sort of, I guess, sequences of operations on the planes of qubits through this device, uh, and feeds forward the measurement result to the next step. And, and by choosing the measurements that are made, the basis in which they're made, and these feed-forward operations, one can essentially carve out a path for the information through this kind of system, which is equivalent to performing um, quantum computation in a circuit model. This is sometimes called a one-way quantum computer because the entanglement resource is consumed as you make the measurements. But the nice thing about it is that although establishing this cluster requires entangling operations of the same kind of a CNOT gate, uh, this can be done sort of offline, if you will, and then that's a resource that can then be used. Uh, and the single qubit operations and measurements, which, as we said, are incredibly high fidelity and high performance, can be used to, to process the information. So there's a bunch of work uh, by Terry Rudolph and many collaborators over the years which is looking at how one can do <clears throat> ballistic quantum computing, so not even requiring memory, uh, in a scheme that uses these kinds of clusters. So here's an example of, of a 3D cluster that one might make. This cluster may, in fact, even have some imperfections in it, uh, and there are techniques for dealing with those imperfections using percolation theory and so on. Um, but the idea, if we think about a two, 2D cluster, the idea is sort of something like this. The cluster doesn't even have to all exist at the same time. There can be some parts of the cluster, cluster so here, here at the end, uh, that have been uh, measured already and consumed. Uh, there's some cluster that exists at the moment uh, and that, uh, you know, measurements are about to be made on. And here's the future cluster. So there are sources making uh, entangled uh, photons and building onto the back end of the cluster even as the front end is being, being measured and consumed. And so there are open theoretical questions about what dimensions need to exist in this active zone, the length, the breadth, the depth, if you will, uh, but it seems like it's not outrageously huge. 
Uh, one of the things I should just mention is that, of course, a lot of the theorists who've worked on this are now tied up with the Psi Quantum Company. And so it'll be interesting to see going forwards um, how much of, of that, uh, those, those theoretically develop, theoretical developments are publicly released. OK. Um, so in our center, one of the things that we're particularly actively pursuing is the cluster state scheme for continuous variables, OK? So there's a lot of theory work being done by Nick Menacucci and collaborators. And uh, our partners, such as Akira Furusawa's group at Tokyo and Olivia Fister's group at Virginia, are working on making these kinds of devices and have demonstrated 1D and 2D clusters in frequency encodings and in temporal encodings uh, with uh, very large cluster sizes. OK, so let me say just a little bit about the temporal encoding here. Uh, we have some, some, some different uh, pulses of squeezed light uh, coming from these uh, parametric oscillators. They're mixed on a beam splitter, which, as I said, gives you some entanglement. There's some delay lines here, which allow you to basically take these entangled modes, these entangled squeezed modes, and to, to shift them temporally in time, and then to interfere them again with the next one along. And then one builds up a kind of cluster state uh, where the lines here show the linkages, and it can be mapped onto, a, in this case, a 2D cluster. OK. Um, so this is all very nice, but um, how are we going to realize all of this? We've sort of shown. Uh, different uh, media or platforms for doing it. And so I want to say a little bit about uh, the three techniques that one might use, free space, fiber, and waveguide. I'm not really going to say much about fiber because I'm not saying much about networking, but let's talk about the other two. OK, so this is an example of a typical um, you know, few qubit uh, linear optics quantum computing experiment. OK, it sits on a breadboard uh, in an optical lab. Uh, and it's not uh, sort of inherently technologically scalable. Why do we do experiments like this? Well, as um, one, of the, one of the squeezing community said, I think it might have been Roman Schnabel, we do these kinds of experiments because they produce simply the best fidelity. I mean, we're very, very good at doing these, and we can do complex operations. We can learn how to build better sources. We can learn how to do uh, different uh, conceptual techniques. Okay? And when it comes to doing things that are not universal quantum computing, it may be that this kind of platform is a perfectly good way for doing uh, networking tasks and other things, particularly since it can still be uh, considerably miniaturized compared to, to what this looks like here. Just by way of reference, this laser here is you know, probably, I don't know, what, three quarters of a metre long or half a metre long? OK, but ultimately one wants to think about scaling to uh, a miniaturized platform where you can have multiple devices in a very small space, something equivalent to the electronics uh, industry. And so this is the idea of integrated quantum photonics. OK, so devices that something like this, uh, not uh, electronic circuits, but optical circuits on some kind of uh, chip platform. OK, so here's an example um, of a device uh, that Alberto Peruzzo has worked on in the past. You can see it compared to the size of a small uh, European coin. OK, so uh, many, many uh, modes squished into here and, uh, in, in fact, can be even made smaller. Now, if we're going to go to this kind of platform, uh, what one needs is to have uh, sources, waveguides, delay lines, beam splitters, phase shifters, all the usual tools, detectors uh, in, in this integrated platform. Okay? So one's looking for uh, a material system and a technology system where all of these things can be put together uh, and realised in, in a practical kind of way. Uh, there are many different materials that one might choose. On account of time, I'll mention, I'll mention two. One is, of course, silicon. Okay, we've heard uh, from Andrea that silicon is a, is a technologically ready platform. It's something that people do processing in already, including in uh, classical uh, silicon photonics. And so uh, here's an example of, of a bunch of optical uh, circuits on a, on a classical, uh, for classical applications. OK? And uh, one can get very high uh, index contrast ratio between the waveguides and the, and the surrounds in silicon, which means that you can pack uh, components in, in very, very high uh, density. But there's another very interesting platform, and it's the one that we're looking at mostly in the centre, which is lithium niobate. OK? So lithium niobate is also uh, a really uh, great technology, and I'll say a little bit more about that um, as we go along. 
Okay, so there have been um, some sophisticated demonstrations of putting a great many um, components onto a silicon chip. This is by uh, Bristol. Uh, they're a partner of, of our uh, centre. Uh, and they have uh, sort of many sources, um, you know, photon generation steps, if you will, uh, you know, moving the photons around, interfering the photons in different ways, and so on. So chips with sort of, you know, getting to hundreds of, hundreds of elements on them in a very compact kind of way. Okay. Uh, but we're interested in using lithium nibate. And one of the reasons uh, that lithium nibate is really, really nice, yep, yep, is that it, is, it enables uh, really beautiful uh, switching, fast switching, uh, nonlinear processes in the material and can be made very low loss. Okay, here's an example of some work uh, which is a collaboration between uh, Mirko and the groups at ANU and ADFA, okay, to do, generate squeezing on chip and to basically do the homodyne uh, interference part of the experiment here and to see squeezing on chip which can then be built in, in a pathway towards uh, CV cluster states. This is done with dopant waveguide in silicon, but a very low loss technology is the technology being pursued by Alberto Peruzzo uh, at RMIT with making uh, ridge waveguides. So this lithium niobate is, is uh, sort of deposited on top of a silica layer on top of silicon, so it can be integrated with silicon technologies, but it can be made incredibly low loss with incredibly fast switching. It can be cryogenically compatible uh, and uh, one can uh, make, uh, as, as, as Alberto is doing, uh, making ring resonators, really beautiful sidewall etching, uh, come along, can do things like uh, design structures for integrating quantum dots onto uh, chips uh, for, for writing uh, detectors onto, onto the chips as well. Okay, so there's so much more to say about the optics space. I haven't even talked about sampling problems. Um, photons are ideal for some non-universal kinds of tasks because of their bosonic nature, and uh, there are efforts within and outside the centre uh, to that. But um, let me conclude by just reminding you that one of the reasons that we're interested in optics is because of these different advantages, uh, interacting networks with computing devices, low noise, the ability to, to muster many, many photons. And we've talked about how uh, that optics plays out with all of these different uh, tasks. And so it gives us the idea of optics as a platform, perhaps an integrated platform, uh, in which we can uh, have sources, operations, and detectors for large-scale quantum computing and other quantum tasks. Thank you.